Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth. Another great episode we have prepared for you today. If you are following along on the video version of this podcast through our, one of our channels at YouTube or on Facebook, we invite you to make comments below and participate in the discussion in real time. These episodes uh, do really well when you share, comment, and like them. So we, we invite you to do that now. If you are watching or listening on the audio version through one of the audio players, like Google Play, Apple Podcast, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or any of the others, we invite you to subscribe to this channel as well. Subscribing gives you first look and first, first access to our podcasts as soon as we release them. If you want to help us support the Latter Gay Stories podcast, we also invite you to visit our website at LatterGayStories.org and click on the Donate tab and make a financial donation to the podcast. You also can make a financial donation in another way, and that's through Venmo. We are Venmo friendly. You can simply send us a donation through uh, Venmo by uh, hitting us up at at Latter Gay Stories. That's at Latter Gay Stories, or find us online at LatterGayStories.org. The Latter Gay Stories podcast is your opportunity to better understand the intersection of LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. It is your chance to better understand the uh, the world where we uh, mix religion, uh, sexuality, and reality all together. We again thank you for joining us on this episode and want to welcome to the podcast the Smarts. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thank you for giving us a few minutes of your time to tell your story. Um, today's podcast episode is going to be, um, I mean it's down my lane, it's mixed orientation marriages. It's uh, understanding how um, to make a mixed orientation marriage work. The the highs, the lows, the understanding of sexuality, understanding the personal and individual journey, uh, which is uh, really important. And uh, in our episode today, we're also going to talk about where the church has gone right and wrong and left or right of this topic, but even more importantly, how society, um, how as people, we can better understand this topic. So again, thank you for giving us a, a couple minutes, and I'm pretty excited about uh, the chat and, and today's podcast episode. Me too. So um, we'll start with you, Sonny, because you're the non-straight spouse in, <laughs> in the mixed orientation marriage. Sorry, Joe. Um, you're Wasn't out, that obvious? You're outnumbered. I'm not now. that interested. So. <laughs> <laughs> We're not that interested. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, let's start just to get a little bit of a, a background. At what point did you realize, I'm different, there's something different about me? Yeah, I'd say I, I realized, you know, I can picture myself around 11 or so. Um, I realized some things were a little maybe different about me than other girls, other kids. Um, I, knew, I knew that I had an interest in girls, and I also knew that wasn't something that was talked about uh wasn't something I heard about and so I knew something was going on with me that wasn't a common experience um I grew up in a really religious religiously and politically conservative home uh, my mom was a director of stop ERA which is now timely again uh in both California and then in Utah and so in our home, um, feminist was a very bad word. And uh, I wasn't allowed to join Girl Scouts because in my mom's words, it's a bunch of feminists trying to turn little girls into lesbians. Wow. And I didn't know what a lesbian really was, except that they were part of this group that was trying to destroy marriage, um, put all babies in state-run daycare, send women to the front lines of war. like So I just knew they were kind of monsters. Uh, so growing up, I didn't really have a language for the things I was experiencing and feeling inside. Um, my mom did have very, very dear friends that were gay men, and somehow that was different. I'm not sure. <laughs> Not sure why, but uh, so I didn't have a language. I just knew I was feeling some things that were not okay. And then as I got into young women, um, you know, the few discussions we had around sexuality, uh, it was more, you know, how girls are gatekeepers, um, not that girls have 
their own sex drive, their own desires, but I knew I did. And so I knew that set me apart. And then I knew that I liked girls. So there was kind of this double whammy where I, I also learned in young women the term um, sexual deviant. And that was all I could think that would possibly describe who or what I was. So I never talked about it because I knew it was very, very bad and that God knew it was bad and that God did not like me or love me because I was disgusting. I was a deviant. And so I tried to really just bury as much as I could of that um, going into my teen years. And then as a young adult, um, looking back now, I see the crushes I had on women that I worked with in my early 20s um, that I really, really liked, but I couldn't put that language to it. I didn't understand then what I was feeling. Um, women I knew that did come out, I was fascinated with them. I wanted to know everything about their lives, everything about their experiences. I wanted to be around them and I was embarrassed by that. Um, but I still couldn't put the words to my own experience that this was also my sexuality or my experience. So I really, you know, I served a mission for the church. I just did the things that you're supposed to do and tried to ignore this part of me that was just broken and wrong. And I really didn't want anyone to know about it. And I didn't want to think about it enough to figure out what it was. Yeah, this sounds like the typical Mormon story. Um, you have those that recognize fully and understand, so they bury it um, and hide it away. And then the other part that dabbles or tries to understand, then does everything that they can do to avoid. And mm -hmm. and we see that topic in church. Any any I think any topic that centers around or has anything to do with sex, um, the church is very taboo. Um, mm -hmm. No talking about it, no acknowledging it, and then that way off you go. Um, yep. I mean, even even Kimball in the 70s uh, concerning this topic was um, of the mind that if you talked about it, you become. Yes. And so a lot of families say, and, and that's... <clears throat> And we see that not only just in, in sexuality, but um, ab avoid the appearance of evil. I mean, all the things that... The Suicide. Anything yes. that is just uncomfortable for any reason for someone. If you don't talk about it, it just can't be real or it won't happen. That's right. And yeah. it creates usually the opposite result. That's right, because there, there are people who are directly impacted by that topic and they need uh, answers to their questions. And when they're not getting them, then they explore those and, and just try to figure that out. So uh, completely understand that. So you served a mission. Um, you eventually decide either I'm not fully gay, I don't fully understand this, or it's time to get married and move on. So it's, I mean, it's mission, marriage, children. That's the typical yep. uh, path that the church likes you to take. Um, so what was dating like? At, at what point did you now start saying it's time for a family and it's time to move on? Yeah, dating was odd for me. You know, as a high schooler, I wanted to date boys because I wanted to be included in the things that were happening. Um, I didn't go on very many dates and I couldn't understand it. Um, you know, I I looked pretty feminine. You know, I did all the whatever. But um, I, you know, I thought, why doesn't it ever click for me with guys like it does with my friends and as I got older you know Joe and I met working in the desert in Arizona and um, you know I had, I had liked a few guys there um, didn't really work out um, you got engaged at one point didn't you I was briefly engaged um, yep before I dated Joe but that was kind of the extent of it it just things just didn't quite line up the way I'd watch other relationships line up but with Joe um, we were really good friends before we dated and um, you know I had I had female friends that I was very very close to and our relationships were just they were happy we laughed all the time we just loved each other so fully and I think with Joe what I began feeling was a sense of that same level of intimate friendship like I was I felt very safe with him I we laughed 
nonstop. Um, that's really how we became friends. And I, I, I don't think that I didn't fall in love with Joe. I do love Joe, but I think part of what I experienced was something like these deep, deep relationships that I had had. And, and so in my mind, this was it. This is what people are looking for. This must be what it is to find the one. Um, so much so, in fact, that I proposed to Joe. Well, yeah. well first, I, <laughs> first I told him to date me. <laughs> I told him he liked me. <laughs> I really did. I said, I know you like me, which I didn't know if he liked me. And I think you should date me. Um, and then a few months later, I told him he should marry me because it would be fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And this is the ring that I like, and this is my ring size. And well, no, he actually um, <laughs> he he made me a ring um, while we were working out in the desert. I didn't know he was making it. He made this ring. He worked on it for weeks, and then a few weeks after I had told him to marry me, um, we got off work one week, um, and he got down on one knee and put it on my finger and said yes. <laughs> So, um, pretty unconventional, but really it was like, it was such a sweet relationship in so many ways. And, um, I remember a deep, deep fear that if I didn't marry Joe, I would never find again what I felt with him. And that fear was probably right. I probably wouldn't have found another man that I clicked with in that way, you know. So that's. He wasn't very masculine, though. So. He's not very macho, and that helps. Like so. all the girls liked hanging out with him because he was so fun and comfortable and safe. I'd say, right? Like you were always road tripping with all the girls, and yeah. he was one of the girls. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> no. Um, do you have anything to add to that story? Or? No, I think, I think it was great. You did a great job. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so that's, we got married and we were immediately pregnant. Yeah, probably on our honeymoon. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, yeah, so we just started right off and that was that. And we had four babies really close. Yeah. This time of year, it doesn't sound very good. We have a 19-year-old. And then a fourteen-year-old at the at the end. So and they're four all together. So four under five at one point. So yeah. our oldest was barely five when we had the fourth. Our oldest mm-hmm. had just started kindergarten, and a few weeks later we had our fourth baby. So it was a lot. It was a lot for everyone. Yeah, it was. <laughs> but at this time, you're not identifying. Um, mm-hmm. uh, there's nothing on the spectrum that you're saying, this is where I'm at. I'm not lesbian. I'm not gay. I'm not any. I'm just married. And, just married. Yeah. Um, I put all that aside. And yeah. it's happy, healthy companionship, children. And you're moving forward. Yeah. And around the same time, so as, you know, probably when we had about two kids, um, my best friend since I was 16 and, a, and really one of Joe's best friends, um, who worked, we all worked together. Uh, she came out as gay and, you know, this is someone who she served a mission at the same time I did, you know, all those same things. Um, but she came out and I do remember pretty distinctly thinking then, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with Sarah and I don't I don't think she's any different than she ever was and I think that started to crack the door open for me to begin to accept some things about myself that maybe it wasn't so shameful it wasn't so dark because looking at Sarah I didn't feel any of those things toward her she was just Sarah and and again I was internally so fascinated by her and whatever was happening and probably a little bit jealous that she was experiencing something that I was so curious about, Uh, but I still hadn't put that language to it. So, you know, a few years went by, but I think after the, the birth of my fourth baby, 
a lot of things seemed to crack open for me. It was kind of my the time of my feminist awakening. So I guess my mom was right. If you turn feminist, you also turn lesbian. Because it was it was a thin mint, I promise mm-hmm. you. It was, and I really do love Girl Scout cookies. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I started to kind of find myself. I I had struggled with my relationship with God my entire life, and I was coming to a point where I was realizing maybe I didn't have to accept the God that I had been handed. Maybe there was something different out there, a God who really was loving, who loved me as I am, not as something he wants me to be. Um, So a lot of things began to crumble for me, but that's also when other things began to take shape. And I really was beginning to feel my own personhood. So in that time, I think that's when I started to be able to recognize and verbalize some of the feelings that I had without shame. Um, You know, I've said this before in other places, but I remember going to say movies with female friends of mine and maybe there was a scene with two women and afterward we'd all talk and could you ever kiss a woman? Could you, you know, and and I'd listen to what they had to say um, and in listening to them, you know, oh, I could kiss a woman, but that's it. Or I realized, okay, one of these things really is not like the others. And it's me. Um, I didn't ever verbalize to them the extent to which I felt differently, but I knew it was there and it began to work in me. And so, you know, around that time I had said to Joe, you know, I think I, I think I like women, like I'm attracted to women. And I don't, I don't know if you even remember that or... No, I, I mean, I do. I just remember thinking, well, of course. <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> He's thinking, yeah, who isn't? Um, so, but it wasn't, it didn't feel like a threat to anything or... No. No. So, um, you know, but each time I kind of cracked the door a little wider, it made it a little safer to begin maybe pushing a little more. And I feel like that's how it went throughout my 30s was after being able to say that, uh, there was a time in my mid to late 30s that I was able to say, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm bisexual. I remember telling one friend and I told Joe, and you asked me at that time, you know, if that changed anything. Yeah, that's, I guess, yeah. I I was worried at that time, like, you know, where we'd be at. Yeah, I think that's an interesting perspective. So I, I want to explore that a little on from Joe's perspective. Um, I've, I've actually ran into this a few times in the podcast, and mostly it's because of alcohol <laughs> that people start confessing things like, "I think I'm bi." Um, <laughs> I think there's some, so the great motivator is alcohol. But in your if, having that conversation, Joe, in that situation, what does go through your mind? How how do you start processing something like? your wife well i mean being bi wasn't much of a threat because i mean 50 50 chance it's still me (laughs) and she's married to you and we're married and i might be attracted to other women other than you know sunny but i'm still married and committed to that so she might be attracted to women and other men but we're still married so i'm not excluded from the fat from the so it wasn't much of a a threat at that you know so I don't know. I wasn't worried. I guess, I mean, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> I'm not, I am not cutting that out of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. Um, <laughs> yeah, I feel like the thing about Joe and I that has sometimes surprised people over the years is how much we talk about, how much we tell each other hash out, um, talk it out to the death, even things that have been extremely painful for us. Um, not a lot gets swept under the rug, would you say? If you say, yeah. (laughs) He's doing all the sweeping. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) yeah. Um, but I think that's true. Like even in really difficult things, we end up just saying it. There's a lot that we just say, Um, and so 
I think for me to say I'm bi, on the one hand, I, it wouldn't be as shocking just because there's a lot we just say to each other. And two, I would imagine that there was some level of trust that if there was something more going on, um, it would get talked about. Well, yeah, and I mean, at that point, there it really, I mean, nothing, there was, I mean, not a concern. Yeah, it was just a thing, you know, like, oh, well, I like ice cream and also girls. Yeah, um, and, and, and as we better understand this topic through our own personal journey, it is literally the line upon line, precept upon precept concept. Mm -hmm. You, I, I did this uh, an interview with Josh and Lolly Weed, and that was one part of the interview that I really um, appreciated. That as their story went viral, and as people started understanding this mixed orientation marriage side, Josh is very gay, Lolly is very not. Mm -hmm. um, they also, she also knew that going into the relationship, into the marriage. Um, that Josh was gay, but they were going. To, they were determined to make it work. But the interesting part that Lolly brought up was that you don't know what you don't know, and that was a really uh, well put together point. That um, often people will come out as bi because that's at that point all they know, right? Um, and, or they don't come out at all because they just have not connected all the pieces yet, and so there there is neither room for for doubt or ridicule or inconsideration because you don't know what you don't know and that's where that process happens that's I, I think that's the key to authenticity and honesty is that we we begin the path and that we walk down it for a while right and often it's dark it's but there's light at the end of the tunnel um, and we continue to walk towards that light to gain better understanding and that's the important part of it. I, and I think um, if more people better understood that concept of don't fear getting on the path for what the path may lead you to. Right. Um, and, and maybe that's what I got most out of episodes like Josh and Lolly's or even your story, that we, um, we shouldn't fear what the end of the path looks like or halfway down the path or even further down the path than we are today. Right. Well, I think we have such a, in the LDS Church, have such a model for how you know, each part of our life works. You know, like you, you start. You said the first three. You know, where you go on a mission, and get married, have kids, and then at some point, grandparents go on a senior mission. And if uh, I guess, you know, whatever you're, you're picked to be a, you know, a mission president or whatever. You know, that's that's where you head in that direction. And with this is a factor. It's just an unknown. So you don't have a model. You don't know what it's supposed to look like, and that, that's kind of scary, for sure. Well, and I think religion does a really great, great job at um, trying to prevent the unknowns. They, mm -hmm. uh, religion is created to help us say, we've already carved the way, mm -hmm. this is what it looks like, and don't deviate off the path, or as recently as you heard in Mormonism, uh, don't get out of the boat. Yes. Don't fall out of the boat, don't rock the boat, don't, <laughs> don't even, in your brain, don't consider that you're even in a boat. Right, don't acknowledge the water. Yeah. <laughs> and um, there are actually a lot of people who are stepping outside of the boat only to find that they're floating in three feet of water and right. they're able to walk to shore. Right. The boat wasn't safe harbor. The boat was just floating in the water um, being controlled. And that's the interesting part of this journey as well, that, um, that maybe the boat wasn't the answer, but being able to be independent and explore and journey yourself is the answer. That's back to authenticity and honesty again. Yeah, something I've realized, one of the major changes that had to take place in my life, and this was in kind of rediscovering a sense of God in my life, um, was letting go of fear. Understanding how much of my life was driven by fear. Fear of punishment, fear of not making it to heaven, fear, you know, you're either going to get a punishment or a reward. And so there was always this fear of God, fear of my choices. Um, and it, it felt like there was supposed to be this path, right? But what if you got it wrong? And it just felt like the end of the world. And, and in kind of letting go of this idea of what this God that I'd been handed, that's, I think, the thing that I gave up the most was fear of God. And when that was gone, all that was left for me was love and opportunity. 
I don't, I don't fear my choices the way I used to. I don't fear my children's choices. I want them to be happy. I want them to make choices that lead them to personal growth and joy and that are good for other people, but I'm not afraid that they'll leave the path, that they won't make it, that we won't make it as a family. None of that registers in my mind anymore. And it's one of the greatest gifts I feel like I gave myself was letting go of that so that no matter where this path leads, I don't feel like I have to know the end from the beginning. I just feel like it's okay. It's okay to stumble along. It's okay to feel one way and after a while say, you know what, I don't think that's it and, and choose a different path. I really think it's okay. I really think that if there is a God in heaven, that God cannot possibly expect us to just get it right, whatever that means. I think we really are supposed to learn. We're supposed to fall down. We're supposed to try things and, and not even find the right thing, but find what does create joy and growth. And that there are so many options that can do that that we don't have to stay in one little boat. There's a whole world and it, and it was given to us. So why not explore it and find our many, many places in it? And now that world isn't controlled by the two great religious motivators, guilt and shame. Right. Um, made to feel guilty and created to feel shame. And I, I just have, I agree with you. I've just never, coalesced around those two as great motivators. I, I usually find guilt and shame to be great depressors. Yes. And, and again, that, that keeps us pushed. So in talking about that, that path and that trail, um, at some point did you deviate from the trail from I'm by to did the trail take you somewhere further? Um, <laughs> did, did you get... Um, was there more light and knowledge to be learned uh, in your path? <laughs> Definitely. Uh, yeah, again, it was probably a few years after I had said, you know, I'm by things, you know, that door is pushed open and I'm starting to glimpse things inside myself and realize my feelings are much stronger for women than I had realized. The more I was able to think about it, because again, I'd spent my whole life try not to think about it. And so it really is line upon line. And when I did tell Joe that I was pretty sure I was four girls, um, I feel like it was met with, there was some surprise and I don't know if this is too strong a word, but almost a little bit of a sense of betrayal, you know, cause there was like, well, I thought you were bi, like, how do you now, do this and I think you described it well that process of you don't know what you don't know I didn't know what it was to be gay I had no language for it most of my life and I hadn't ruminated on the feelings I was having or but once I was able to kind of explore those feelings in a safe space that being my own mind and heart really that's when it was able to settle and I was able to realize the intensity of what I felt. And um, I don't know, is that accurate to say it was kind of like a betrayal or how would you describe? Uh, just, it felt like loss. I mean, I didn't, I don't, I don't know if betrayal is the right word, but just loss and, and hurt, you know, that it felt like, you know, I wasn't, um, like I didn't know where I'd fit in. Mm -hmm. You had told someone, uh, you know, about me coming out and being gay. And I remember you, you told them a time frame, like how long you'd known that I was actually gay. And do you remember I was really upset Yeah. because it made it sound like I hadn't told you or, but I thought about it later and how our experiences around that were probably different when like how long ago would did you feel like I had really started telling you I guess for me like the part of it is more selfish I guess because I've centered on where like up to that point 
I'm in the picture. Mm -hmm. I'm in the story, and that that I guess that's where there was a lot of loss and a lot of tears and just heartache. Mm -hmm. And you weren't out, so I didn't have anyone to talk to but you about it. So I um, that's I guess that's why it was kind of stuck in my mind. So when someone was mm -hmm. asking me about it, and it was kind of new to even talk to someone else about it, that's what stuck out in my head. I'm trying to remember when that was like when you talked to them if you said oh I've known for a year I've known for um I think I said like for two or three years okay but, but I didn't acknowledge any of the past conversations we had even from the early on in our marriage like oh she's bi she's yeah. Like, yeah and I also like you um like I remember not knowing what to tell people because mm -hmm. I'd say, well, I, t I said, you're, you know, you're gay and they're like, and they made the assumption that you're just into women mm -hmm. and, and you went, okay. And I was like, but what should I tell them? <laughs> 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 yeah. And that's true because when, so, you know, fast forward to when I thought, okay, I'm definitely gay. Um, and then, and I hadn't. Well, when I did come out, I was struggling with the language around it. I preferred the term queer. Um, I think it took me until about probably four or five months ago to be really comfortable with lesbian. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with my upbringing. It was just such an ugly word. And it brought up pictures in my mind of women that I thought, well, I'm not that. And I don't want anyone to think I'm that. And so I really struggled because I thought, if I say I'm, I'm bi, I think most people, like Joe said earlier, they think it's a 50-50 thing. And that's, there are some people who do experience bisexuality as a 50-50 split. Um, but that's, that's not truthful for me. And then if I say I'm a lesbian, well, that's just ugly and gross. And if I say I'm gay, everyone just assumes lesbian. So queer felt so, so much better. It's but, ambiguous in a way. Yeah, but then everyone's like, what does that mean? We yeah. don't even, that's a word we can say? We didn't even know we could say queer without someone getting mad. And so... But you can always, I mean, at least when people would say, well, what does that mean? I'd say, well, that's what some, somebody's comfortable identifying as and they're they immediately back off yeah <laughs> so and then you didn't have to explain it <laughs> yeah because I didn't know either yeah yeah and I think in my own understanding and exploration over time there is a there is a little bit of bisexuality there that I've been able to realize which is I I enjoy being physically close to men like I love to just be close to Joe it's something I crave um, but in the past for me that has meant well that must be also sexual attraction because that's what it's supposed to be and what I've realized is that's where it stops like I can find men attractive I know when I'm watching a show or like oh that's an attractive man or um, but I've in searching myself, I realize like I desire a physical closeness, but not sexuality with men. And so is that a form of bisexuality? Is it, you know, I don't know. I don't know what that is. And so how do you label it? But it's been, I think it's been good for me to be able to ask myself those questions. Like, why do I think, you know, a man in a movie is attractive? Do I want to have sex with them? I don't, you know, so what is that? But I think that's the thing. Like, I think there's such a variation in sexuality and attraction and all those things, but we don't usually talk about it. And so we don't know what we're experiencing. People are afraid to admit that. And when you say like the 50-50 chance, the reality is most people are on this scale somewhere. And I say the overwhelming majority. There are men who uh, were, are perfectly straight, perfectly comfortable being straight, 
um, that would be a, a Kinsey zero, mm -hmm. um, have no sexual attraction to men, but find other men attractive. Mm -hmm. um, would they consider themselves gay? No, not ever. But in their brains, do they compare? Do they analyze? Do they uh, see themselves wanting to be close to other attractive men? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I mean, in terms of bisexuality, I think if we really nailed that down, we would find that the majority of men and women um, fall not at a zero or a six, but somewhere at a four or five on this Kinsey scale or three or, or somewhere um, with some level of fluidity. That, right. that, that always is constantly moving and changing. I think that's key. So, so queer it was. That's where, we, that's where you landed. Yeah. For a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Queer it was. Um, but then I started just using gay a lot because queer just always invited questions. And I thought, meh, I'll just say gay because it's easier. Um, now I do just say gay. Um, I don't mind the term lesbian at all. Um, and then, you know, as far as like bisexuality, I feel like I, there's just no need for me to explain that to anyone unless it just came up in a setting like this. Um, and I feel like the other problem with bisexuality for me is that because of what people assume it means, it puts an expectation on our relationship and other people's minds that isn't a reality. You know, it's just this, well, it can't be that bad. She's bi. You know, it can't be that hard to navigate this. She's bi. So obviously she likes both. Back to the 50, 50. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And, and it seems safe. Yeah. And it doesn't leave space for what either of us are experiencing in our marriage and our relationship because it, it just is comfortable for everyone else. Mm. You know? Yeah. Great point. Um, so I want to shift gears just a little bit and now talk about how that revelation to get you to the, to the point where you identify as gay, um, which I think is the umbrella term for I'm also lesbian, I'm queer, I'm, uh, um, I am best described by the, the situation or community that I'm explaining myself. Um, so now how does that, how does that impact or how, or did it change your relationship with the church? Um, where does that come in for better or worse? Yeah, um, I had stopped attending church for the most part probably four years yeah. previous to coming out. So I came out just over a year ago. So I had stopped going to church and part of it was uh, women's issues. Part of it was the treatment of LGBTQ people before I was truly identifying really even to myself. Was it the November stuff or the, was that? The I had stopped going before the policy. Mm. Um, yeah. Is that right? That was right four years ago. Uh, um, no, November 5th, 2015. Was that summer though, before? It know. was, yeah, it was a little before that. It was a little before that, that I, you know, and I had been struggling for a number of years um, with just, yeah, women's issues were really difficult. For me, and that's generally. that's Kate Kelly time as well. Yeah, um, there all were of that. there were a lot of things happening four all years ago. Of that. Yep. And I am a pretty vocal person. Um, yeah, so it was. It was also when um, like gay marriage was, I think, being legalized somewhere. Yeah, because yeah. that was reaction to that. Yeah. So, so Supreme Court, all of that happened, but I was already like. We'd had a fifth Sunday and how. The... Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> again, how you should stay yeah. in the boat. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So. I wasn't really active before coming out, um, but then um, what was interesting was internally with this this push that I had that I need to come out. I I felt like I was suffocating, and it had been that way for a while. Um, but every time I would think I'm going to come out, I would think, well, I have to tell my kids, and I. I don't want this to negatively impact them. I don't want them, one, to worry about what's going to happen to our family. And two, we live in a very Mormon and conservative area. And so I thought, socially, I don't know what this is going to do to my kids. So that was my concern. But as that feeling had grown and grown and grown, it coincided with Richard Osler 
coming to Boise to do a presentation and I didn't really know anything about him. It just popped up on Facebook and I thought maybe I'll go to this thing. Um, I was really dreading it. I thought this will just be, you know, excuses and, uh, you know what, as long as you say you love gay people, we're good. And I thought, I don't know if I can sit through that, but let's find out. And I ended up inviting my bishop and my stake president, which was pretty out of character for me to reach out and, uh, neither of them could come, but my stake president asked if I would come and tell him what was talked about. And so, um, it was, it was really a lovely evening with Richard. I was pretty surprised. It was obviously geared, you know, toward an active LDS audience, but I was impressed with what he was able to accomplish in that meeting. And I was really touched by it. And, uh, the feeling that I walked away with was, you know, I'd had a lot of anger toward the church. Um, one of the reasons I had to stop attending was that every time I went, I would just get filled with rage. And after a while I thought, this isn't healthy for me. It's not helpful for anyone else. I need to just step away. So I carried that for a long time. And, and sitting there listening to Richard, the impression I had was love, love really does go both ways. And it is so often the right answer. And if I want people who I feel like are on the other side of this chasm to understand my experience and to reach out in love, maybe I could try the same thing. Maybe I could try to understand why people are over here feeling the way they are and maybe I could do it with love. And so when I went in to tell my stake president about the meeting, that was kind of the attitude that I had going in which again was very different to the attitude I had had previous. And so we ended up having this really great conversation, he and I, um, and because this was a world I had been kind of plugged into through online communities for a while, there was a lot I could offer him as far as education. And he had expressed that he was hoping to learn more and to do some outreach in the state. So we started visiting and after, probably our third long interview, he said one night, I just wish there was a gay member of our stake that I could talk to, to kind of understand what their personal experience is. So he had no idea that I was gay because I just wasn't out to anyone. And so I finally just said, well, that's me. Here I am. Here am I. Send yeah, me. <laughs> yep. And he was, um, he was actually really thrilled because we had already developed this rapport. And, you know, so I said, yep, that's me, I'm gay, and you can ask me whatever you want. Because at that point, I also knew I could trust him. And so that's, that led to my public coming out because after about a month, he asked me if I would be willing to meet with all the bishops in the stake and do a Q&A with them. And I knew at that point, if I was going to out myself to that many people, I needed to be out to my children. And so that was the catalyst because I had a really, really deep desire to be helpful within the church for people who choose to stay or people who feel they cannot leave for whatever reason, and especially youth. I wanted to help create the safest space possible within a space that often is not very safe. And if we could just make our community a little better if we can make it better for one kid who comes out to his parents that they respond in love even if they go to their closet later and scream and cry if we can just get it right more times than we're doing right now then yes i will talk to the bishops i will be out to anyone you want me to be out to if we can work toward a community that embraces LGBTQ people. Which I think fits right in line with what Elder Ballard spoke at at BYU. We need to do a better job at understanding and listening. The two things, yeah. understanding and listening to the LGBT people yeah. and their experiences. Um, and I, th I think you hit the nail on the head. We are terrible at, uh, as Mormons, um, terrible at understanding and listening to people who are different than us. It's so blinders or iron rod that 
we're trained not to pay attention to the great and spacious building or the fog and dense uh, yeah. wilderness. It's just the iron rod. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Yeah, yeah, and again, it's that fear, right? We're so afraid of what might happen. Correct. If we hear something that maybe we shouldn't hear or, you know, when we started those meetings, it was, it was interesting to hear the fear around if we do talk about this in our wards, how do we talk about it? What words do we say or not say? Do we, you know, there, it's such taboo that everyone has been raised with and been taught that it felt like crossing some huge line, maybe we'd be in trouble. You know, it, it took a, a lot of effort to normalize the language around this experience and to talk about why that language needed to be normalized. I reached out to um, Cal Burke mm. um, and asked him because he had this large Twitter following because I thought, here I am, one gay lady in a mixed orientation marriage. Um, I can't represent all the gays <laughs> to these people. I can't represent trans people. I can't, rep you know, I can't do that. And so how do I take more experiences to these bishops and to my stake presidency? And so I reached out to him and asked if he would ask his followers a question, knowing that this is what it was for. And what he asked them was, what makes it hard for you to be in the church or to stay there and what experiences make it easier and he got flooded with responses and so i printed all those up and i took them with me because i wanted i wanted more voices than mine to be heard as we talked about what is it that we keep doing that makes it so hard to stay, even for those who say, I know the challenges inherent in being LGBTQ and LDS, but I want to make it work. What are we as members doing that make that even harder than it already is? And what can we do to make it easier for those who choose it? And what can we do for those who step away to still feel like, as Richard Osler would say, they're not outside the circle of our love and our community. and and can we do that as an LDS people? Because we often are afraid of people who step away. That's right. And it's easier to distance ourselves from what feels like an evil or unrighteousness or a darkness. What would it look like to keep someone within our community in a way that says, wherever you walk, I walk with you because I love you. And that love never changes just as God's love for you never changes. So as long as you will have me, I will walk beside you. And I don't try to control your choices. I try to understand them. And I walk beside you no matter where they lead. What would that look like for a community of LDS people to do? And what kind of fear would that remove from our children's choices or our partner's choices and to know that I don't have to fear what you do because I know you don't step outside God's love. And if you don't step outside God's love, how could you ever step outside mine? So that was the goal. And another big fear is the people in coming out or having a child that does is the loss of community with the church. Mm -hmm. So if the church is accepting, then it's one less barrier, you know, one less like hardship. Yeah. And what does it look like to accept within these parameters? Because that was the thing I knew I was dealing with is I can't change the policies or what we call doctrine. That's I can't do that. You can't do that. My stake president can't do that. That's not for us. So if what we're working with is already set, what can we do within that that just says, I love you and I'm with you? Because... We don't have to change the policies in order to love each other. And those policies often prevent people from loving one another. But my hope has been, can we see beyond that? And can we say, we don't even have to talk about those policies. Yes, we can talk about the pain and the reality of it, but we don't have to talk about challenging those to members who are you know, in the pews every Sunday and that brings up a lot of fear. Those can, what if those never change? But can you and I change 
for the better. And I hope, I hope within our stake that has started to be created where people know they are loved. And maybe a third leg of this stool is something that actually Richard's brother David um, acknowledged in a study that he put together and just published in a recent book that only 2% of Latter-day Saints who left the church or had a faith, a crisis of their faith or a transition of their faith felt that their stake president or their bishop ad adequately answered their concerns and questions. Mm -hmm. and. Those concerns and questions re revolved around LGBT issues, uh, church history um, issues, and a, a better understanding of their worth. Mm -hmm. um, Two percent of the stake presidents or bishops acknowledged and was best that they felt uh, that they were able to take care of those three areas for them. That means 98 percent of the bishops and stake presidents failed. Mm -hmm. uh, or didn't do a good enough job to retain that member. They didn't know how. They don't know how. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's not that I, 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 I will absolutely give uh, the church credit here. It's not that, I don't believe that the church has created a system that intentionally fails those three areas. Right. I think it's that they don't know how. Mm -hmm. um, we, we aren't trained to love. We, we are immediately trained to disregard anything that appears to be evil or uh, has stepped outside of that circle. And protect the church over the person. Uh, isn't that exactly the basis for many excommunications? We have to protect the good name of the church, yep. um, which is the language that is often used. And so uh, it is circling the wagons and keeping the predator and the wolf out. Um, but really, there, there will come a time where there's not many people left to even move the wagons in a circle right. if, if we keep um, hemorrhaging and, and compressing like is happening. I think so too. And I think one of the things, you know, when, when I talked first with, with my stake president and then as we met with these bishops, um, again and again and again, we focused on simply listening and what that looks like and what it means. And the responses that I got from Cal, that was so much of what people said is, I wish my bishop could just listen, not try to correct, not try to change me, just be in this with me. And so that was a large focus. Um, and the bishops really responded to it. But what I felt like was, it was almost like giving them permission to create that space. I think bishops feel and stake presidents feel an enormous pressure to have the answers and to fix situations and problems. And when there is not a fix, when there's not an answer, a lot of times in that space we create answers mm. that are not accurate and actually are more painful. And we spend a lot of time talking about those answers and why we shouldn't just make things up because we think it, it makes us feel better as the one who's talking, that we think it'll help someone. But we spent so much time on why it matters to be able to listen and to be with someone in their pain. It doesn't mean we agree with everything that they say. My stake president and I, there were things we ended up never agreeing on, but there was always respect and kindness and love in our conversations because we could listen to one another. So I could understand where he was coming from. I didn't have to agree with it. He could understand me and some things changed, some opinions changed, others didn't. But to be able to sit with someone in their pain, to acknowledge it and to tell them that you see their pain, that you hurt with them and that you want to be with them and to acknowledge, I don't have answers for this. I wish I did. I think you know I don't have answers, but what can I do to serve you and to be with you while you walk this journey will go so much further than trying to fix something that either doesn't need to be fixed, like someone's sexuality, or something that is unfixable, like the pain that comes with realizing there is not a place in this theology for you as an LGBTQ person. So I feel like these, you know, 98% of bishops and stake presidents who weren't able to reach that place, I think so much of it comes from 
being absolutely okay with not having answers, being absolutely okay with the fact that people do have agency and may make a choice away from what you hope and that you can still love them fully. Doesn't mean you have to agree with things that happen, but you can love them fully and you can just listen to their pain and their stories and be in it with them. Which is exactly what Elder Ballard has asked the members of the church to do. So that, that, that process was you, uh, that all comes with coming out to this group of bishops, uh, but you said you had to get to the, your children. You had to come out to your children. Yeah. Um, and that was all wrapped up in this experience as well. How, how did that happen? How did that go? Uh, so I did come out to my kids before I met with the bishops and my oldest was away at college. So, um, I really, I waited till he came home on a break. Um, but I didn't tell him first. I told my second, my daughter, um, and you know, she had gone to an art high school. She had lots of friends who identified everywhere on the LGBTQ spectrum, Um, she had quit going to church around the time I had. Well, yeah, it's complicated. It's complicated. (laughs) But I mean, she, she is someone who from a young age, I mean, she has her views on things. She was, she, yeah, she decided she was atheist at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Around the time I quit going to church, she was like, oh, P.S. I'm atheist. So, um, but her, her best friends, her best friend. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, two moms, and uh-huh. so when she told Sunny, or when Sunny told her, she was just excited to tell all her friends. Uh huh. That was it. I said, I need to tell you this, and I'm emotional, and I'm like, I'm gay, and she was like, Can I announce it at school on Monday? Like, this is the best thing ever. It's like she's finally in the queer club, and so I have street cred. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, like now I'm not just like some weird ally, like. <laughs> My mom is gay. (laughs) So she was totally pumped. And like, it was really tender because I was emotional and she was just kind of, you know, sweet with me. Like, mom, you're crying. Like, are you okay? But she just, you know, for her, it was just like, great. No big deal. It's like, like, interestingly enough, it was almost a role reversal. Like sometimes parents have to go through that experience where their kids come out and um, you hope that the parent is the strong one. Right. And here is your daughter who's like, are you okay? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. like why are you sad? This I will sit great. with you with empathy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it was really sweet. And then I told my oldest, Adam, next. And, you know, so I told them each privately because I wanted them to have space to have their own reaction, not try to read what other people were feeling and how am I supposed to feel here? I really did want them you know, if they were angry, if they were confused, if they were devastated, if I wanted them to have space for whatever that was and the time that they needed for that without someone else saying, well, why aren't you okay with it? Or so, uh, I told him and I, you know, I was a little bit emotional again and, and he cried, but then he just said, thank you so much for trusting me and for telling me I love you and I just want you to be happy. Whatever that means for you, I just hope that you'll be happy. And that was really the extent of it. You know, he also, he, you know, in high school had friends who were gay and friends who were trans and, um, and up to that point, you've been, you were like the hyper ally as well. Mm -hmm. Like, so the kids were, I mean, they were raised in a home, very accepting. So, you know differences so yeah that's true the well the well had been primed the the pump had been primed yeah and you know adam has talked about this experience and he said you know he's like i look back and like at 12 i remember thinking like it's kind of the worst thing in the world if someone is gay because this is what he had absorbed at church but as he got a little older and then you know started into high school things started to shift for him as he thought more deeply about it and it it didn't make sense anymore. It didn't resonate with him as truth. Um, and it began to bother him, this attitude. And, you know, then, you know, we've got the Supreme court, you know, all this is happening. And then the, um, the policy. And by then he had really searched his soul 
and decided what he believed and it was not in line with what the church was saying and so he had quite a few experiences in high school with challenging seminary teachers you know who were spouting misinformation he had had a temple recommend withheld in high school because he publicly supported gay marriage on social media and our bishop was misinformed and thought that that was in league with you know coming out against the church and and adam corrected him and shared quotes and you know um it it took him going to our then stake president and being corrected the bishop had to that he then came back to adam and apologized and said you were right i'm really sorry now i won't make this mistake again thank you <laughs> that darn spirit of revelation right yeah. but he he had a lot of these experiences and so he really knew where he stood and so by the time i came out to him it just wasn't a big deal and i asked each of my kids you know with me coming out um part of it would be being public like i have a desire to help other people feel accepted and loved and i need to know how you feel about that and you know and ellie had said obviously she didn't care like let's tell the world uh but you know so then i said to adam you know, I don't want this to affect you negatively with friends or, you know, and he was like, mom, I don't have friends like that. And if I did, who cares? I don't care what people say about this. Like I know what's right. And so you don't need to worry. Like you should feel free to tell whoever you want to tell and do what you're going to do. And, you know, and I told him about going to the bishops and he was so supportive and excited about that. And, um, so then I told my next oldest, who would have been 14 at the time, yeah. And he's one that kind of keeps things close to his chest. And um, he, you know, I told him and he just was kind of like, okay. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, um, I might talk to people about it. And, you know, he's the only one of my kids who attends our like neighborhood high school. So he goes to school with like the ward members and the, and I said, I worry about that. And he's like, mom, my friends aren't like that. And I said, yeah, but other kids are. And he's like, so he's like, and if they are, it'll last like two days and they'll get bored with it and move on to something else. He's like, I don't care what kids at school say about anything. And I was like, all right. Okay. And I did tell him, that over time he may feel a lot of different emotions and that that was okay. Like he might think he's okay with it now and he might be, but a month, six months, a year from now, he may wake up one day and feel really angry at me. He may feel really sad. He may feel fearful. And that I wanted him to know that there was space for that. And that if he wanted to, he could talk to me or he could talk to his dad. But if, he didn't want to do that, that I wanted him to feel free to talk to whoever he felt like was safe to talk about that with. And, and so that was also part of me wanting to be public as soon as I told my kids, because I didn't want them to feel like they were my secret keepers in any way, that this was something they needed to carry for me. I wanted them to know that whatever their experience was around this, they were free to talk about it and that they didn't owe me anything in that and they didn't owe me a certain response or certain feelings around it that there was space for whatever came at any point it's really it's, healthy it's a really healthy approach i mean i hope so it's you know it's something that's it's out obviously in our family um as far as deep feelings no one seems to bring that up a lot but i hope if my kids are having fears or feelings around it that they're talking to friends or talking to other trusted adults if there are times they feel like, I don't want to tell my mom this is how I'm feeling. And I hope that they feel comfortable doing that and know that they're not hurting my feelings by having any of those emotions or concerns. I remember Sam's response being like just coming every couple of days up to you and asking you another question about it. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah, our youngest... Um, he is on the autism spectrum 
Um, he's super sharp and really delightful and also not interested in conversations that aren't about what he wants to talk about. <laughs> so I almost couldn't talk fast enough to get it out because he was, in fact, I'm trying to talk to him and he goes, why are you telling me this? Is it like dad won't listen to you or something? <laughs> I said, you think I just want to talk to someone and dad's busy, so I chose you. He's Story like, of my life, boy. Yeah, and he's like, yeah, I guess. And I'm like, no, Sam, this is important. And so I told him, you know, well, I'm gay. And he's like, oh, okay. And I said, well, do you have, like, concerns or questions? And he said, no, like, I've been reading books about that. And based on statistics in the population, it would make sense that someone in our family would be gay. And he's like, so can I go? <laughs> like that now mostly he just comes up with like inappropriate jokes about mm -hmm. LGBTQ stuff. Yeah, he just like he gets it. Yep, mm -hmm. he's trying it out, yeah. and yeah, he loves it. Here's and, another pun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he's not uncomfortable around it at all. And honestly, the only thing he said to me was, "Uh, I guess I just want to know if you and Dad are getting a divorce, and that's it." And mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. that's the concern, right, for a kid. And and I said. Sam, dad's known for a long, long time that this is who I am. And does it seem like we're divorcing? And he's like, no. And I said, so right now I can tell you your life is not changing. And he's like, okay. And he just bounded up the stairs and, and that was that. So my kids were phenomenal beyond phenomenal in their ability to absorb what they could in that moment and really each of them kind of turning it around and making sure that I was okay or wanting to know if Joe was okay um, which I just thought was so mature and kind to worry about us in a moment where I felt like I didn't want them to feel like they need to worry about us. And that, and that brought with its own, uh, it brought some challenges. Now you have a son that just recently returned home from his mission mm -hmm. um, for standing up for those core beliefs, uh, those things that he felt were important to him. Uh, that others, i.e. his mission president, um, didn't feel were equally important or carried weight. Now, your story was just featured uh, with the Salt Lake Tribune. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about that and how that has impacted the Smart Family. Um, and give us a little background as to the premise of that story. So we were an inactive family. So when Adam went on his mission, Adam just left uh, in September of this year for the MTC. 9-11. Yeah, it was 9-11. Um, so here's this boy who you know has a family that's inactive, but he has decided that uh, going on a mission is what feels right for him. And he gave this beautiful farewell address about his own struggles with the church and as a high schooler we hadn't known that he had almost left the church and um and at that time he said the reason i stayed was fear i was afraid of you know the social repercussions and what if i get it wrong you know i die and like so it was it was just a lot of fear for a young kid and then you know as he gave this address he said you know now i i stay at church because I really do feel that this is right for me. And I still have a lot of questions and some of them may never be answered, but I, I feel like this is where I belong and where the Lord wants me and the same with a mission. So he really had to wrestle with how do I serve a mission when there are issues that really trouble me, such as gay marriage and just the general treatment of LGBTQ persons in the church. But he had wrestled with that. He had talked to our stake president, our bishop. They were well aware of his feelings. And he knew what would be asked of him as a missionary, that I have the things that I feel and believe. And then there's what the church will expect me to teach because I wear the name tag. And so he'd already had that wrestle with himself. And he knew it would be difficult. But he decided to go. And so when he got to the mission field, um, 
in that first night, you know, your mission president wants to get to know you. And so he, he asked about our family and, and at some point I guess asked if we were active. And Adam said, no, I'm the only active member in my family. And so the president wanted to know more about that. And Adam said, well, my mom's gay and that's kind of a lot of it. And, and he was asked how he felt about that. And he was like, I feel like she's my mom and I love her. And he was then asked how he felt about gay marriage. And so here's a boy who has, one, had to stand up for this all throughout high school and known where the line was. He knew he what was said. Picked on by seminary teachers. Really picked on by seminary teachers. And, and then also had been cleared by a bishop and stake president who were very aware of his beliefs. And so I think he answered these questions without any concern because he knew he'd been through this before. And so he just said, well, I support gay marriage. That's how I feel about it. I feel like everyone should have the right to love who they love. And, um, and his mission president's response was, well, we'll help you with that while you're here. And Adam very boldly said, well, I don't want help with it. I know what I believe and I'm good. Um, but on the way to the mission field, Adam had misplaced his wallet and, you know, a couple weeks in to his mission, he was told they were going to go to the temple. And so he thought better get a recommend. And so during this interview, uh, the mission president, it really feels like use that opportunity to hammer home this issue. And he, uh, you know, when, when he asked him, do you sustain the brethren as prophets, seers, and revelators? And Adam answered in the affirmative. The president stopped him and questioned that and said, how can you say you sustain the brethren when you believe in gay marriage, you support things that they don't support? Um, and Adam tried to explain that it's more nuanced than that. You really can do both. Uh, but the president didn't like that. He asked him about Elder Oak's recent conference address and how Adam felt about that. And Adam had said it had made him weep for the people that he loves that he knew would be very hurt. And it was a really hard day for him when that was delivered. And and from that, the, the president accused Adam of not sustaining President Oaks uh, because he didn't like the talk and told him that all the brethren agree um, with what Elder Oak said, and therefore, if you don't sustain what he said, you can't sustain any of the brethren. Uh, it just kind of went on and on from there. And then the question that has recently been changed six or seven about, it used to be, do you affiliate? And now it's, what, do you hold any personal beliefs? And Adam answered that question and his answer was not accepted. All in all, I think that interview went on about 45 minutes. And in the end he was told uh, he couldn't have a recommend and that without a recommend, it would be hard to remain a missionary. Um, and Adam... An implied threat. Yeah, it was, you know, laid out for him. And we... This happened on a Thursday. Adam's P day was on Monday, so we didn't find out till Monday because being an obedient missionary, he didn't call or text. Or, uh, But in the meantime, too, the mission president reached out to an Area 70 who, by what the mission president said, agreed with the mission president's choice for, you know, whatever he heard through the mission president, he agreed this boy should not have a temple recommend. And... And our state president, too. Yeah, and then a, another... On Saturday of that same week, he got on a conference call with our state president, who, you know, I had worked with so closely over the last year, and who had sent Adam on a mission. And... In that call, the stake president supported the mission president, and that was a huge blow to Adam. I think he thought this was one person who knew his heart and understood him and would have his back, and he really didn't. And in that phone call, the stake president suggested they give Adam a week to pray and then reconvene. Well, for Adam... It was a week to change his mind. Yeah, because if in if in a week he doesn't feel differently and he can't have a recommend, it's just a logical next step that he would be going home. And so finally on P-Day he called and he was 
beside himself. He had been crying and praying all weekend. He had prayed about changing his mind. You know, maybe I've got this wrong. Maybe, and he said, mom, I can't, I can't change my mind. I don't, I don't have it wrong. I know what I believe. And I think they're going to send me home. And it was, he'd come to turn that point. He had come to a, like a place where he knew he was coming home mm -hmm. and because he wasn't going to change his mind. Yeah. And, you know, so it, it escalated from there with us, you know, trying to get a hold of the mission president to figure out what was happening. And it was, it was a rough few days. Um, we had a not very good conversation. I was mean, very mean to the yeah. mission, mission president. <laughs> yeah, we kind of, we both agreed we're going to be very calm. We were not. Um, this I'm normally is, very nice. Yeah, I'm usually the bold one, and he's usually very, very even keeled. Um, what, what it came down to, I kept asking, you know, what what is expected of him? What do you want from him? What, and they kept using the word sustain. And I finally said, I need to understand what that word means to you, to the mission president. Um, and he said, well, it means agree with. And I was like, well, then that's a non-starter because I don't think that's what it means at all. I don't think that's what we're asked to do. And if that's what you're asking Adam to do is agree with, you know, whatever comes down, from Salt Lake, that's not going to happen. And so where are we now? If he doesn't agree with, you know, and so finally it came to, he didn't want to say, well, he'll have to go home. So finally he said, I'll have to ask Salt Lake if he can stay on a mission without a temple recommend, which has that ever happened? And he said in that call, which I have never experienced. Yeah. Because you knew when you took the recommend that that is what happens. So, um, when you set up the crisis, yeah. yeah, yeah, it was, it was just an ugly few days. We tried to work with our stake president. Um, you know, he called us in to talk, but he spent two hours convincing us why this was such a great idea. We that, didn't let him talk enough to convince us. <laughs> no, <laughs> but he wanted to side with the other leadership and tell us why it was good that Adam didn't have a recommend because now he wouldn't be going to the temple and hearing about heterosexual marriage and what a struggle that must be for for him to be in the temple and hear about that and like well Adam doesn't disagree with heterosexual marriage he wants to marry a woman in the temple but you well, know such mental gymnastics yes. well, the thing, like our state president is a very smart man he's mm -hmm. amazing, like really kind and loving but put in the position he was you become kind of not bright and uncaring and that's like he was caring and like dismissive mm -hmm. and it was a weird combination i kept challenging him to do the right thing before he was told to do the right thing because we were confident it would come down from salt lake to reverse what was happening because it was so ridiculous um, and so Joe did keep saying, I think, you know, you know, what's right. Yeah. You can feel it. Do the right thing now. Don't wait to be told what the right thing is. And yeah, but he did not agree with us. It's very interesting how this correlates well with the November 2015 policy, how the general membership of the church knew that was a bad policy, but nobody or very few, I shouldn't say nobody. There were people for sure. Right. But the, but the general consensus, the general membership of the church just said, well, if it came from a leader, I guess we just have to buy it. Yeah. We have to own that. In fact, the people who had said when they first read it said, this is anti, this is a hoax, it can't be real, the church wouldn't do this. And then the minute they find out it's legit, turned on a dime and supported it. Like, how did you think this was anti? And now it's the word of God. You know, go with your first instinct here. Um, yeah, so many people, right, just defended and defended and defended. And the only reason to defend it was it came from a leader. Yeah, 50 North Temple gave it, so therefore it had to be correct. Yeah. And then when 50 North t took it away, the good Lord giveth and the good Lord taketh away. Exactly. Then it was like, yeah, we could see how that was such a harmful policy. We were also and... relieved 
and yeah. the church is so much better for not having that policy. Well, I'm, I'm backing up a little bit. I'm sorry. Like on my uh, the birth, like the May before I left coming to church, you know, there was someone put out a news press release as if it was from the church, apologizing for the horrible history the church has had with the LGBTQ community and black people too. And black, yeah. and I heard it, and it was on my birthday. We were out for breakfast, and I was just so happy, and I felt like, and then when we found out later, just, you know, moments later, it was just a hoax. Like, that's what broke me, I think. <laughs> it's like, to be given everything I thought I, you know, would need, and then... To realize this really is what you're hoping for from a church that will most likely never... Yeah. But well, we don't apologize, even if, apologize. and we don't accept criticism, even if it's necessary. Yeah, yeah. Not my words. Right, and so you know, here's here's this boy Adam who has learned himself. Like I don't, I don't accept things just because they're handed to me. I weigh them. I pray about them. He, you know, was in high school when the essays started to come out on the church website, and. He would read them and he would come talk to me and mom what do you think about this and what and and i had i've told him his whole life you know like here's what i think here's what i've arrived at you don't have to arrive at the same conclusion you have a good brain you can think about things i think god trusts you so here's here's where i've arrived i might be exactly wrong i'm happy to find that out sometime you can take what i've told you and take what you read and and you go study it out and decide how you feel about things. And and he's a kid who's interested in doing that. And so he, he really is a kid who knows his mind. He knows what he believes and why he believes it. It's not because someone in the church office building said it. It's because he studied it out. He's weighed it against God and Christ. And what do I know? And does this measure up? And so for this kid to be sitting you know, on a phone call with his mission president and stake president and being told essentially he's wrong. And, you know, the words were, uh, this will, this will affect more than just your mission. This is going to affect the rest of your life, like this belief system. And, you know, it's, it's so ominous. Uh, actually it'll make him more kind and loving and unconditional. <laughs> yes. And I hope it does affect the rest of his he, life. Me too. I, yeah. You know, and it will just not the way that they're trying to tell him it will and yeah it was it was something else and and so by the time a few days later after talking with salt lake and all these things the stake president essentially turned on a dime mission president. sorry mission president turned on a dime and called us um with well, apologies like hours before like an hour before two hours before sonny was like we'd been texting him not getting much of a response and he was like uh, talk to your stake president and stop talking to me. Yeah, he wouldn't communicate with us really and then had finally texted to say, I don't have any information for you. You need to be patient. It'll be a couple days. 40 minutes later, I get a message saying, can we get on a conference call? And uh, he apologized for the way our first phone call had gone. He apologized for putting Adam through this and had a whole plan he wanted to run by us, which was a plan that we had set out essentially given our stake president and said, this is what needs to happen. And you need to tell the mission president needs to happen. I don't think he ever did because he didn't agree with us. But what it came down to was he said, I want to call Adam in and I want to apologize to him for all of this. I want to give him his recommend back. I want to um, tell him that I respect and support and honor his personal beliefs, that he is, of course, free to hold those, and that unless Adam brings this topic up, we will never talk about it again because it is not my place to try to change his mind. Um, yeah, that was that was the plan. I can't think of any intervention aside from, I mean, an amazing awakening he had or... I'm told how to. I'm guessing that 50 North Temple got a hold of him. Yeah. And said, "We don't. Here's this a is plan. a horrible <laughs> idea." Yep. Uh, also a PR nightmare. Mm -hmm. Also a PR nightmare. Yes. Um, 
especially with all the things that the church is battling right now with LGBTQ, well, conversion therapy, um, mm -hmm. discrimination in the workplace, the last yes. thing the church is going to need. And we're not talking about something that happened years ago. We're talking about weeks. Yeah. yeah. And with a new question, everyone's wondering what it might mean. And now you're saying this is what it means, right? And yeah, to be told essentially, you are not free to think for yourself. And are we going to be on record for this? Knowing that Elder Christofferson himself said, uh, he was asked this specific question, is it okay to attend a gay marriage, mm -hmm. a wedding? Is it okay to support same-sex relationships and within fact, my family? even on social media. And even on social asked. media, yes, and, specifically. Yeah, And, and he was, said, absolutely. Yep. <laughs> You have the differing of opinions where you have Oaks that says, I wouldn't even take my kids out into public. Right. Don't expect us to show you off to our friends. And Yeah. And I don't prefer that they, any homosexual work in any type of uh, job around children or in the public education system. Or So we have opposite polarized opinions, but... The most contemporary is Elder Christofferson's, who says... That's, said what, to, I mean, that's, that's what's funny is, is, like, sustaining to agree, and how can you agree with all of those differing opinions? It's a great point. Mm -hmm. um, and, and my further argument to that is, if this is the Church of Continuing Revelation, then it, this church should also say, what Elder Oak said in 2006 is no longer valid. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the most contemporaneous message which was elder christopherson regarding this topic is what we're going with now is the fit but the church won't do that right therefore you have two conflicting messages yes and how do you sustain both of those messages it's a yes. great point yes exactly and i'm sure adam's point is exactly that because he knows he knows all these things which defies ex what the mission president says if you don't accept one, you don't accept all because there is uni unanimity in the yeah. quorum. And I can tell you with no. my experience, the quorum is not unanimous um, on this topic. Or probably most topics. That's correct. Yeah. And also, why do we have councils if everyone just simply agrees? That why it makes it obsolete, right? There are 15 people because hopefully they are of very differing opinions on many things and they listen to one another and talk through those things. And yes, they present a front for the most part that is united and unanimous, but no, they are 15 minds, 15 different life experiences. So no, you cannot agree with to sustain. And last I checked, the gospel doesn't include forced free agency. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So. We we did have a good conversation with the mission president that night. We were nicer. We were nice. <laughs> he was nice. We were nice. Um, and I he mean, we got our way. So <laughs> he did ask, you know, if then he could talk to Adam. And so he called Adam in the next day, and uh, and then I got a phone call at the end of their conversation with both of them in the room, and and he said, you know, we've been here talking a little over an hour. Adam reported after he got home that it was closer to three hours they had been talking. Um, and Adam did say, you know, it was a good talk. I feel like there's an understanding. Um, but in the end, you know, as he's sitting in front of his mission president, he said, Mom, I just, I got to come home. And I said, okay, tell me more about that. And, and he just said, I am so beaten and broken. And I am so, so tired. I just can't do this. And I said, you know, son, you have experienced a spiritual trauma. And while there's a chance you could heal from that still in the mission field, if that's where you chose to stay, it completely makes sense to come home and take the time you need to heal. And if you want to leave the door open to serve later, if at some point you say, I feel like that's what I want to be doing is serving a mission, then that door can be open. But the priority is that you heal from this and you feel safe and you feel loved. And um, he just needed to get out of there. And so the arrangements were made and the president did you know, try to convince him to stay while I was on the phone with him. And, um, and I found out later after Adam got home that 
throughout their long talk, that's what most of the talk was because Adam had told him I'm going and he kept trying to convince him to stay and he had said, you know, well, what do you think your mom's going to say when you tell her you're coming home? And I'm sure for a lot of missionaries, that works. They don't want to disappoint their parents, right? And Adam said, she'll say she loves me and she supports me and that she trusts me to make a decision. And so then he would keep at him because he thought that's not the answer I want. I could tell your mother's not LDS. She's not active. (laughs) And so when they called and and that's essentially what I told him is Adam I love you and I support you and we'll do whatever you need to do and I'm sure the mission president thought dang it. (laughs) But that's a tough that's a tough situation for the mission president to be in too because he is the direct reason why Adam came home. Absolutely. And that is what Adam says as well. And, you know, he was asked to write a paragraph about why he came home. And uh, go ahead. Well, this is the paragraph. Mission President was like, put in a good word for me. Kind of. I mean, he didn't say that. And we can't put words in his mouth. Sorry. But he did kind of talk Adam through, like, what is that going to say? What do you feel like? And kind of got to the point of, making sure Adam had an understanding that he was absolutely invited to stay on the mission. Therefore, this is Adam's choice. Adam is going home because he's making a choice to go home. I started the mountainside on fire, Mm -hmm. but then I put the fire out. So we just want to talk about... Give me credit for putting the fire out. Don't... Or don't even talk about the fire Yeah. and what I did. Just talk about your choosing. Oh, what tangled webs we weave. And, And so when Adam called us... You know, he's like, I don't know how to write that. And I said, you write your truth or don't write anything at all. You don't owe anyone anything. And he said, no, I want to write it. And I'm going to write exactly what it is, which is, dear president, I'm going home because of you and what you did. And because there's no other truth to it. This boy would be out in the mission field answering questions and not fearing people's hard questions and loving people and but he felt completely blindsided and attacked and beaten up by two priesthood leaders and yeah, abandoned by one and mm-hmm. beaten by the other and and the rest just grabbed oars in the boat and continued to push the boat in the in that direction yeah and that's i think i can see that as being one of the most difficult parts of that it's not I mean, you have a stake president that was on board for so long, Mm -hmm. and then when he realized that other people were rowing in a different direction, he just grabbed the oar and did what everyone else was doing. Yeah. And that's difficult. It's Yeah, it's hard. And it was hard to witness when I told the stake president, uh, you know, here's the talk we had with the mission president, and he said all these things, you know, pretty much verbatim what Joe and I had said needs to happen. Um, I... I did not feel a joy or relief from him. It really felt like confusion and, um, you know, I don't want to speak too far about what he was feeling because I don't know, but I, but I can imagine that was surprising and in a way a letdown because here he had essentially sold his soul for a mess of pottage. He had damaged these relationships. For what? It would have felt like a betrayal, I think, for me mm-hmm. in that situation where I jumped in line, I did what I should have done against what I thought might be right, mm-hmm. and then, like... Who has your back? Because Then was told that, no, we're, we're switching course again. We went, we're going the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, we're going the other way, and sorry, man. How do we avoid that? I mean, as we wrap up this podcast, how do we avoid situations like this? Now, not everybody's going to be a mission president. Right. Um, not everybody's going to be a stake president. But the general membership, the community, pu- the public, how do we... I-, I want you to solve this issue, Sonny. But, I can. Uh, I can. I can. Well, no, <laughs> go Sonny, for Sonny it. No, it. I want you to say it. I, I want, yeah, I want both perspectives. Yeah. What do we do? What do we do to help? I always talk. I want you to... Well, so my my business partner and, and great friend, like my, my best friend... Um, He's a bishop. He just was recently made a bishop. And he's also a therapist like me. So, he, if, so he'll sometimes do therapy on me and I'll tell him to quit it. <laughs> but um, Oh, now you're above the law. Yeah. So he, um, like when this all went down on Monday when I found out about it, I, 
I saw him, you know, at work, and I just was like unloading, you know, I was just sharing how my how angry I was and upset I was, and he immediately jumped to defend the church or miscommunication, misunderstanding. Maybe Adam didn't understand it right. There's I don't know, something along those lines, and I was I just and I just had said it, and I had to leave because Sonny was rolling, coming up, and we were going to talk. And I was angry, and I get in the car, and Sonny's on the phone, and I'm just like, ugh. And I realized, you know, he's going to apologize, like, later tonight, because he'll realize what that is. And I, what I told him when he did, he called me later at night, he's like, ah, oh, was, that was a dumb, I'm sorry. Those guys are jerks, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I said, you know, as, as a bishop, don't do this. Like, the church doesn't need to be defended. Church is there to help us, not to harm us and it, so in no way if someone's upset with something in the church justified or not just be with the person side with the person and do what's right in your heart for the human in front of you and not some organization that you need to fear i think yeah. that's i don't know well and something the mission president said when he called to apologize is um and i i don't know if this came from him or from someone else but he said i don't want to put policy before a person and I feel like that would solve so 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 many problems that we have in the church is let's just not put policy before people like he said look at the person in front of you and respond to them respond to their needs respond to their heart to their pain to their joys don't be thinking about an entity and how you're going to defend or serve it. Because if the church is true, truth doesn't need defending, especially against the sheep who are on the margins and who have been wounded. And And God of all people or beings does not need us to defend him and go to war with one another to defend God's honor or or speculation as to what God thinks or... Right. Yes. Just love the person in front of you. You will never, ever err or go really wrong when you think, you know what? I'm just going to love. I'm just going to think, how can I help? And I don't think we're ever going to offend God when that is truly what we're trying to do, is just be gentle and loving and truly kind of crawl into the world of the person in front of us and try to be in their experience with them. And I'd say the other answer is um, be like Adam. Know what you believe and why you believe it and stand for it. This is a boy who stood up to a mission president and a stake president knowing what was at stake, who wouldn't lie and say okay I now think whatever you want me to think so I can stay here or he was true to himself true to his beliefs and true to his God and I think if more of us could just do that Adam was more afraid of losing his integrity than making someone mad at him and I feel like that's what's required of us just do the right thing because it's the right thing. Not because someone else told you it's the right thing. Not because... Don't wait for permission. Don't wait for permission to do the right thing. Just do it. Just do it. If later you find out you were wrong, okay, go back and correct that. That's fine. I really think there's space for that. But just honor your heart and do the right thing. And, you know, I look at Adam and I think... I want to be like Adam. I want to be someone who speaks up for truth wherever I am because I know that that's what is right and that is what is required and you can like it or don't, but this is what is right and I won't dishonor myself because it makes an easier path. You already are like Adam, so. I think Adam's better at it and at a much younger age, so. Um, I think if we could do that for one another, I think what we'd find is more similarities than differences. 
between us, if we really were able to speak what was in our hearts without fear, I think we'd find that we agree with each other more than we think we do. That's a great point. We're afraid to say it because it might be the wrong answer. But if we just spoke and we were honest, I think we would connect with one another much more. And that understanding would lead to more understanding. So I think the way forward as a community is not to repeat to one another and regurgitate the things we've been told because we think it's right and we think it will get us the reward. I think it's just to truly let one another see our hearts and then respond to that in one another, to just be true and honest and to honor the truth that other people carry. And I think it will connect us. That's hard because it's not a recipe. It's not a recipe. Not no. Steps to that. It, al- it also defies that, uh, that experience that 98% of the membership is experiencing. Yeah, if, I mean, I think that 98% of those leaders felt like they had to know the answer and were threatened that they did, couldn't solve this. If they were just willing to say, oh, it's such a mess, I don't know. Like, yeah, I'm here with you, and I I, think I don't know the answer either. Then they would have felt the place. Half of the 98% would have been okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, There is something to be said about Nephi's, we don't know the meaning of all things. Yeah. Um, And I think the majority would be okay with, okay, we don't have the answers. Maybe that is the article of faith that says we just we will be open to new revelation and that is the importance of this but to run from it or to completely create a false narrative um that's the easiest and funnest that's where it goes (laughs) that's where it goes south yeah i think you're right um you know if we believe in continuing revelation then we have to believe we don't have all the answers excellent point and if we believe in a prophet why do we need a prophet if we already have all the answers. It is it is not just okay to say we don't know, it is required of us to say there are things we don't know if we believe in revelation, if we believe in a prophet. Otherwise, why? But on the why other hand, we, is we, we also cannot say everything has been revealed and we have the fullness of truth. Yeah, we can't. We cannot say that or we have no need of a prophet. That's we, right. And so I think yeah, let's get really comfortable with, I don't know, we don't know, the church doesn't know. That's okay. It's really okay. And it creates, it suddenly opens up this space where we can walk together. And specifically this LGBTQ space, where it does allow the ambiguous and gray to thrive. Yeah. Not just survive in the shadows, but this community can thrive. Yeah, and I would say that is something my stake president, I feel like, does so naturally and did do with me as we visited. Um, He didn't even know until our third or fourth visit that I wasn't active. Um, We really didn't know each other. And and so when he said, will you talk to the bishops? And I said, sure. I said, but like you also know I'm not active at all. Um, And he said, no, I didn't know that. And then he said should that matter? And I said, well, I don't think so. Um, and he said, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me at all. And it truly never did. And there was never a sense of maybe I can get her back to church through this. I did start going to church like here and there throughout that process. I had a desire to be there, to be with my community. And, um, but there was never a push, never a push for me to be different and so we were able to have this relationship because I was able to be where I am and who I am and I I truly did feel loved as I was not as a potential and I think that's so imperative and and I can remember him saying to the bishops um, you know we need to let people know we're here to walk with them um, and even if they choose to leave the church they need to know that we will walk beside them as far as they'll have us and i think that's a depth of love and understanding the gospel of jesus christ that not everyone has 
and I was grateful to see his example of that. Great, and I think that um, I think those um, answers are both vital to helping understand this topic and doing better and doing more. Anything we didn't discuss that you wanted to bring up? Any last tidbits? I mean, this whole podcast episode has been full of good nuggets, so. Um, I just say for people who are in mixed orientation marriages or uh, someone whose child comes out to them or a sibling or a friend or anyone, um, I'd say if more people could be like Joe, it'd be a pretty happy world, really. I mean, Joe has been my true friend through everything. And as he touched on, it's been painful. It's been painful for Joe. It's left both of us in a place where a lot of things are unsure, but in more of a sense, it happened to Joe because I'm the one that came out. And so, you know, it feels like this was dropped in his lap and well, she asked me to marry her so it's yeah her. i mean it's all my fault like right and you're like i put a lot of effort into that ring so exactly two weeks two weeks exactly that's i mean yeah who, who wants to give that up exactly um but in the face of all that so it's not that he hasn't acknowledged the pain and the hardship or questions um but it's that he's stayed in the moment with me and he has communicated and he's allowed space that I need. Um, he's never, I guess it's never felt like he has blamed me. Um, so while I am part of the pain he experiences, I have never felt blame for that. He has been a listener and he's been willing to learn, you know, as I went through, I think I'm this, I think I'm that, or this is how I'm feeling now, or even language. How do you talk about things? He's been open to correction he's he's been my friend he's been i think what an ally absolutely should and could be because he's always trying i mean i bought this watch band so i mean matching he bought us matching watch bands oh Oh! look at us go yeah so (laughs) really that's that's what i would say is he's remained open and not though this is so personal he's not made it personal and about him in a way that cuts us off, if that makes sense. I get the sense that it's, a, it's about us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there's an effort there. And our kids, you know. So we don't know what the future looks like down the road, but we know that we we want happiness for each other and we want happiness for our kids. So you're saying you don't know what you don't know. We don't know what we don't know. We don't have a model to look to for how, how it's supposed to look. <laughs> nope. So that, that, yeah. And I think that's why we call that the navigation. That's the journey. Yep. But thank you for um, sharing your story. And I think the importance of podcasts like this is to give people an opportunity to see that they are just fine. That yeah. it gives them hope. It gives them the ability to see that there are other people out there in a similar situation. Um, most importantly, f- I think from this podcast episode, uh, we can learn that um, the gray areas are perfect and comfortable and exactly where most of us need to be. Yeah. That neither black nor white is space that we need to live in. That um, it, it's okay to, to f- uh, progress and it's okay to doubt mm-hmm. and it's, o- it's okay to step into a space that feels uncomfortable. It's okay to be a kid with a gay mom who decides a mission is right for him and your whole family's inactive. Yeah. You know, like, it's all okay. It really is. And it's okay to choose to come home from a mission. Like, I think life is so, there's so much out there, right? There can't just be one tiny little path. Like, try something. And if that's not it, it's okay. Try something else. Great. It's great advice. Again, thank you.
There you have it, the Latter-day Stories podcast, uh, another wonderful episode. What did you learn from the podcast? Is there something there uh, that really uh, resonated and touched you, that made you think, made you wonder, um, or even uh, made you decide to do differently? I am really interested in what your thoughts are about this podcast. If you are listening or watching on uh, YouTube or Facebook and have the opportunity to chat below, uh, write it down and uh, let's have a real-time discussion because I really am interested in what your thoughts are about this uh, idea of ambiguity, this not living in uh, the black and white world and fully understanding that it is okay to explore and understand and progress and learn. Again, we want to thank you for joining us for this on this podcast episode. Uh, we invite you to like, comment, and share wherever you are listening, if it is on an audio version, through one of our uh, audio players like uh, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or others. We invite you to subscribe to the channel and give us a rating and like as well. The Latter-day Stories podcast is your opportunity to understand the intersection of sexuality and reality, where it meets at LDS Street and LGBTQ Avenue. But most importantly, it's podcast episodes just like this that help you to continue writing your Latter-day story.